I'd like um, to welcome you to Protecting Your Child's Health After Transplant. My name is Raya Hawks, and I'm a pediatric bone marrow transplant nurse practitioner and pediatric bone marrow transplant coordinator at the Children's Hospital of New York, which is part of New York Presbyterian. Um, I will be the moderator this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Cook talk about this important topic. This session is designed to be interactive, so although there will be um, a presentation, afterwards we hope to stimulate discussion um, that will help you and your child continue to grow through this process. We are audio recording each session for those that cannot attend the meeting, so when you ask the question, please make sure to speak into the microphone. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Cook. Dr. Cook is the director of the Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at John Hopkins. Dr. Cook's research focuses on understanding the mechanisms that contribute to the development of lung injury following stem cell transplant and is recognized nationally and internationally for his work in this area. Please welcome Dr. Cook. Well, thank you for that introduction and welcome. This is uh, probably the third time I've had a chance to uh, uh, work with this group. It's really, it's really fantastic, and I'm glad that you guys are here. I'm sorry we have a small, you know, I was really looking for, like, the rock star room. You know? <laughs> That's okay. It'll be intimate. Call me Ken. Forget about the doctor stuff. And uh, I do, um, uh, I'm very interested in lung problems after transplant, and I do have a, um, uh, a conference tomorrow uh, that will be, talking about that. We'll touch about, we'll touch on lung problems after transplant just briefly in this talk, but um, um, it is interactive. If we can wait, that's fine for questions, but uh, from my perspective, um, it wouldn't bother me at all if you uh, ask questions during the discussion. So we always have to have disclosures. This is one I like to talk, so Susan is always like, Ken, you know, you can't stop talking, especially about things I'm passionate about, but this is one of them. And uh, I'm also a Yankee fan. Now, here I feel comfortable. <laughs> Let me tell you, in Baltimore, not so much. I mean, in fact, nowhere in this country, when I say that, everyone boos me. But this year, after losing two in a row to the uh, Orioles last night, uh, <laughs> we're not looking so good. Uh, otherwise, I do have nothing to uh, disclose. So um, when Susan asked me to do this lecture, I was happy to do so. But there's a lot of ground to cover. And these are some objectives that may come up in your binder. Uh, we're really going to focus today, obviously, on the, uh, on the scope of problems that are related to long-term complications after transplant. I want to highlight just a couple of concepts of bone marrow transplant in general, but then we're going to go into as many as we can, uh, these long-term complications that can develop. Uh, I do want to try to spend some time uh, kind of focusing on the risk for developing each uh, complication and put those things into perspective. And, and really, hopefully discuss later, how can we minimize the likelihood and impact of these long-term side effects and try to discuss some steps to managing complications. I will forewarn you, uh, long-term complications are a problem. I don't want you to feel like I'm kind of beating you over the head with this, is a, this can happen and that can happen. Uh, I like to uh, tell my patients and families, particularly in the context of pediatric oncology and transplant, I'm always one about full disclosure. I think if we have, um, even if it's not good news, knowledge is power, and if you're aware of what the future has in store, better off to be prepared for it. And I do think there are, we're making a lot of strides uh, to minimize long-term side effects in the future. So here's a pre-discussion question, a couple, true or false. Because pediatric-based regimens are kinder and gentler, they've been associated with inferior outcomes when compared to adult regimens. I'm a pediatrician, so keep that in mind. Once a pediatric patient is two years out from transplant, all of the patient's medical problems are in their, quote, rearview mirror, and long-term side effects after transplant can be a consequence of pre-BMT therapy, transplant conditioning regimens, graft-versus-host disease, and the effects of other medications that are used during transplant. So think about some of these questions. We'll come back to them at the end of the talk. So what are some, what are some facts, good, bad, or indifferent? So this is sobering. Approximately one in every 285 children will be diagnosed with cancer before the age of 20. And more than 70,000 young adults are diagnosed with cancer every year. I'm a big advocate for adolescent and, and young adult oncology. So when I talk about pedi pediatric patients, uh, keep in mind that we may be 
uh, also getting into some of our adolescent and young adult uh, patient populations. So here are some of the other facts. What are the common cancers? Now this is a little bit of a difficult pie chart to see, but suffice to say that there are uh, some significant pediatric cancers, including acute uh, uh, lymphocytic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, brain tumors and other tumors of the CNS, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and neuroblastoma. This makes up a big chunk of the pie, and it turns out that almost all of these can be treated with blood stem cell transplant uh, uh, in one shape uh, or another. Now, not always, but uh, transplant can be a possible curable, a curable treatment option for a number of these disorders. Now, if we look at the same pie chart, and whether we think of uh, patients less than 14 or that adolescent and young adult patient, it turns out there are some subtle changes, but really those big three of leukemia, lymphoma, and CNS tumors still predominate. And again, I bring this up because these are underlying disorders that can be cured by both autologous and allogeneic blood stem cell transplant. So here's just a couple of slides for an overview of BMT. Uh, you guys are very familiar with this, but just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. So traditionally, the thought of how to use blood uh, stem cell transplant was kind of more and better. More is better. You can give higher doses of chemotherapy. Uh, but now that's kind of changed over the course of time, and this is important because high doses of chemotherapy at the outset of transplant can predispose to many late effects. So the fact that we're actually reducing the intensity of bone marrow transplant conditioning is actually going to help us in the future. Uh, again, traditionally, super lethal uh, doses of anti-cancer therapy followed by uh, a donor stem cell rescue. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, know or will soon know if you're going, uh, getting ready to go through the transplant process. There are many limitations to use. Uh, Regimen-related toxicities, infection, bleeding, and uh, multi-organ dysfunction and failure. Uh, the development of uh, graft-versus-host disease, uh, which can actually be a big issue, uh, particularly when you have an allogeneic transplant, and particularly if there are mismatches between uh, donor and host. Uh, we know that organ injury and dysfunction can occur early and late, and we're going to focus on late. And we always worried about, in the context of transplant for cancer, relapse of underlying malignancy. You guys will probably know, and you might uh, appreciate this, I think the procedure itself is rather lackluster. People say, oh, geez, I'm having a blood stem cell transplant. Dr. Cook, you must be some magical surgeon. Well, uh -huh. not really. This ends up being a blood transfusion of sorts. And I tell patients it's really not about the procedure. It's about the coordination of comprehensive specialized care, not only right around the trans transplant procedure, but in the days, weeks, months, and years after transplant. And this is why you really need to be associated with a program that's going to have significant experience in transplant-related complications, both early and late, uh, risk of relapse and secondary cancers, how the immune system and blood system reconstitute, and we're going to focus today on survivorship and late effects. So this is key, and I'm sure all of you here are associated with programs that are going to have expertise, not again so much about the procedure itself, but in the delivery of care after transplant. A quick overview of graft-versus-host disease, very complex co uh, process. When I talk to patients and families, I say basically it's the opposite to what occurs after a solid organ transplant. So if someone's going to get a heart, a liver, or a kidney, we're always worried about the patient rejecting the organ. In the context of blood stem cell transplant, this process is flipped on end, and it's actually the patient's immune system, excuse me, it's the in, in blood stem cell transplants, the donor stem cell graft that can reject the host or patient, hence that term, graft-versus-host disease. This is a major complication, can be life-threatening, always a risk, unless the donor and host are identical twins. And I can tell you my 20-year career, I think I've had one patient one time where we actually use an identical twin. Uh, suffice to say, this discussion is not about chronic or acute graft-versus-host disease, but it's important to know a little bit about this because it can contribute to late effects. Now, ultimately, our goal of transplant is to develop strategies that reduce the damage of this graft-versus-host problem, facilitate the restoration of the blood and immune systems, and preserve what is known as graft-versus-leukemia effects. This blood stem cell graft, it can cause innocent bystander casualties and affect the host, but it can also continue to eradicate leukemia over time. And this is by far the holy grail. But in addition, as I think about this, we want to capture this and minimize late effects whenever possible. 
So let's go on some, to some of the additional facts. Some of this is actually great news. Outcomes for pediatric and adolescent and young adult patients continue to improve over each decade. That then results in approximately one in every 530 young adults between the ages of 20 and 39 is a childhood cancer survivor. Again, a very sobering fact when you think about it. So this just gives you an idea. This is the good news. If we go back all the way into the 70s, and here is proportion of surviving, you know, still not too shabby uh, when you consider pediatric cancer versus adult, but look at the improvement of survival curves over the course of time. This is, that was for general oncology survivor. This again speaks to outcomes for children and adolescents with cancer. Uh, this is now published just a couple of years ago. This looks at uh, uh, two of the uh, primary forms of acute leukemias, ALL and AML, and sure enough, you do see this continued improvement over the course of time. Now, uh, in another area that I really uh, enjoy talking about, it's the impact of being in that kind of adolescent, young uh, adult age group where they're not seeing quite the increase in outcomes as you're seeing if you're less than 15 years of age, but this is something that we continue to work on, and the same holds true for acute myeloid leukemia. Of course. Do you think that's changed because uh, you're finding um, you're catching the cancers earlier than 15 in the later stage? Sure. Well, that's there, there are many. Men, I, I'd be happy to talk to you even uh, after the meeting. There are so many factors that go into uh, how vulnerable the a, uh, adolescent and young ad, uh, adult subset of cancer patients is. So, and, and one of the things is kind of how quickly they get to medical care. Do they go to a pediatric center? Do they go to an adult center? How long does it take them to actually get to see an oncologist? There are many, many things that actually factor into that. And it's something that is a, a hot spot for uh, research, uh, both kind of clinical and psychosocial. This was a big splash article in the New England Journal of Medicine, again in 2010, Reduce mortality after allogeneic stem cell transplant. Again, giving you the facts. This is good news. And you will see these improved transplant outcomes here. Uh, these are children uh, with acute leukemia. Again, going all the way back here into the uh, early 80s, uh, up through the uh, first half of uh, the 2000s here. Significant improvements of outcome. Same holds true with severe aplastic anemia. I could go through many slides, but suffice to say, this is the good news. We are doing better. But with that, we're going to have more long-term survivors. This speaks also specifically uh, to patients after transplant. This was published uh, more recently in 2012. This was actually set up to compare pediatric um, survivors with adolescent young adult survivors and adults. And it turned out there was actually a ton of patients in this uh, paper, uh, really up to almost uh, 6,000. And what they found is that over... A three-year time period, really from the 80s, the 90s, and then into the 2000s, that we did, in fact, see continued improve, um, improvements in outcomes, whether you were in uh, a pediatric age group, adolescent, young adult, or even the adult. So this was all, again, good news. Uh, and there were experienced, uh, similar survival increases were experienced in each age group over the course of time. Again, uh, getting away from this issue that adolescents and young adults kind of struggle a little bit in terms of overall improvements in survival. So with that, what are the problems that we face? Well, there's no question that the development of cancer and the need for transplant will have a number of significant impacts on our patients and families, threatening the sense of safety and security in our little ones, intensifying feelings of loss of control. There are issues of body image concerns, sense of self may change, occupational path is interrupted in our, our young adults, peer relationships may change. All of these things are going to impact not only early outcomes, but late outcomes, and these things need to be identified and addressed. So what are the consequences of our therapy? This looks at severe chronic medical conditions. Again, this is specifically uh, in patients uh, who had ALL, who are long-term survivors. But, this, but the, uh, the point here, actually, as I'll show you in a second, transcends into transplant. So the consequences of our early successful therapy are organ toxicities, secondary malignancies, <laughs> And this will occur a median of about 25 years after childhood cancer is diagnosed. In this paper by a, an ex-colleague of mine from the University of Michigan, again in 2008, but demonstrates that about a quarter of all long-term survivors actually have report severe chronic medical conditions. And this graph kind of breaks that up 
uh, with respect to whether a patient had irradiation or no irradiation. As I mentioned before, very similar findings have been recently published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology this past year, uh, where Armstrong and colleagues actually looked at the cumulative incidence of severe chronic medical conditions. Blue is their survivors of cancer, and the yellow here are their siblings or controls. So again, I don't mean to make you nervous, but the good news is we're curing more patients, more patients are living, uh, but we do have to identify and address the long-term uh, consequences of our successes. These are just some more examples. So what is the impact on health, thinking about acute illness? This is a graph that looks at just hospital bed days uh, in a 12-month period. And again, regardless of age, this is 18 to 29, 30 to 39, all the way up to 50 plus, uh, patients who are cancer survivors end up having more acute illnesses than uh, population controls. Similarly, just kind of reporting more uh, poor health or chronic health issues, the same trend holds. Cancer survivors here in the dots and non-cancer respondents in the stripes. So again, impact on acute health issues and chronic health issues. How does that impact uh, on, on work? So here's lost work days that are reported. Again, no surprise, cancer survivors are going to report over the spectrum of age increased loss of work. So we're going to focus on the problem and how this all uh, really <clears throat> comes to play when you think about transplant. So remember one of those questions I posed. If you really think about it, there are a number of things, both pre-transplant therapy, therapy associated with transplant, and transplant-related complications, including graft-versus-host disease, that all will play a role on the development of uh, chronic problems and late effects. And these kind of specific medical issues are actually compounded and modified by other intrinsic and extrinsic factors, including age, gender, uh, genetics of the family, social issues, other comorbidities, what other medical problems do our patients have, and also lifestyle issues. So it's really kind of a complex, multifactorial uh, kind of set of complications that we have to keep our eye on. This was a great review that just came out, and I bring these up <coughs> Excuse me, not that you might go and track these articles down, but this is an area, a topic that is very, uh, very much on the forefront of, of interest. So we understand that we're doing better, but we want to make sure we identify the problem and address it. This slide again focuses on the development of severe chronic medical conditions how childhood and adolescent cancer and transplant impact that. And we're now going to talk about some of these specific areas, growth and development, organ dysfunction, fertility and reproduction, risk of second cancers, and also psychosocial and mental health issues. You can imagine this is a large scope to cover, so we'll go fast, but in the end I really want to spend some time chatting about specific questions you may have. Again, maybe this is a little bit of the hammer. The problem exists whether we talk about issues uh, related to bone health and joints, kidney failure, risk of stroke, risk of heart attack, blindness, going oh my goodness, it goes on and on and on. The long-term <coughs> outcomes are, are going to get better and better. We have to keep our uh, heads out of the sand. We have to maintain our connections with our BMT colleagues and our BMT programs and make sure that we go forward eyes wide open to address the increased risks in each of these areas. We also want to make sure that we address knowledge gaps that may occur in this setting. So here's another graph of chronic health problems in cancer survivors. So red is the cancer survivor, blue is the general population. And this graph actually points out two things. This is the cumulative incidence of chronic health problems. So if you look way out as you become 70 years old, the excess lifetime morbidity associated with cancer and therapy is really pretty astounding if you compare what that uh, incidence of chronic health problems is going to be in cancer survivors versus healthy controls. But moreover, these issues begin to occur at an early age. So we need to understand what are the known late effects, what are the emerging late effects, and what are things that we're going to have to keep our focus on as we modify our treatment regimens today, 10 to 20 years from now. So we have to address knowledge gaps that may exist and make sure that we provide information not only to our health care providers but our, to our patients and families. The awareness is out there. This was actually published a couple of years ago. National Cancer Institute and National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute came together to address 
late effects after pediatric stem cell transplants. I was very delighted to be a part of this really fantastic group of, uh, of uh, investigators and physicians. But suffice to say, we're aware and we're trying to figure out firstly, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but what are the pathways that contribute to organ dysfunction? And we understand that there's a primary insult. It could be chemotherapy, radiation, graft versus host disease. And that kind of leads to a cascade of events. The blood vessel linings uh, cells actually get injured. That can cause inflammation. Instead of having nice repair, uh, you can have dysregulated repair and the development of scar tissue and fibrosis. And when that occurs in the lung or the kidney or uh, some other uh, organs, including the heart, that ends up causing dysfunction. The bottom line is people are aware of these issues and we're trying to address them both medically but also both clinically. So here was a follow-up report to that, that same uh, consensus uh, consortium meeting. Again, I was really blessed to be a part of this group, but this came up with uh, some real consensus follow-up guidelines, and we'll have them at the end of the talk in case we have some specific questions. So now we're gonna get into some of the specific areas, uh, but neurocognitive function is gonna be a key one. So there's a 50 to 60% uh, risk of impairment, and this is particularly in patients with brain tumors, patients who had acute lymphocytic leukemia, particularly if you're getting radiation to the brain, but even total body irradiation uh, for uh, uh, blood stem cell transplant conditioning can have an impact here. The highest risk factors if you're also young uh, at the uh, first stage of treatment, uh, and if you happen to be female versus male. Uh, potential deficits really kind of focus on processing uh, speed, memory, executive function, uh, visual and perceptual skills. Other things that can kind of come up in neurocognitive function uh, include att attention and concentration, so the development of attention deficit disorder really without hyperactivity, talked about the issue with processing uh, speed, uh, visual perceptual skills, executive function, these are things that will really come to light in that adolescent young adult uh, area where you're going to college, you're getting your first job. So these are things that uh, can uh, be, uh, ex uh, I should say, exacerbated once you're out uh, into the um, workspace. Yeah, I, I have the time, it's fine. But these are, these are issues that we have to address, and in fact, we can. This is just another example of uh, the parameter, uh, the neurocognitive function parameter, intelligence, memory, academics, et cetera, the age of our long-term survivor, the percent of patients that are actually having severe impairment, and whether or not they actually received radiation, particularly to the brain. And you can imagine, as time goes on, and if you had higher doses of irradiation, then the risks of developing severe impairment go up. Again, it is the hammer. These things are out there, but we know it. So what are we going to do to intervene? Well, I think regular neuropsych testing is key. You have to identify the problems. Early recognition is going to be better. Uh, the use of stimulants uh, in, in childhood cancer survivors is now becoming a bit more prevalent. We want to make sure that we can deliver these medications when they're necessary. They can have some side effects. They can have some growth effects. But you have to weigh the risks and benefits. It's important to be connected with experts in the field that can help you through this. Uh, there are other things that we can do to help our children, environmental interventions, IEPs, school referrals, etc. Again, knowledge is powerful, Ident uh, identify the problems early and try to set uh, specific things up so that we can help our children overcome some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Emotional health is also something that goes hand in hand with neurocognitive health. Clinically relevant impairment in mental health is certainly reported in bone marrow transplant and cancer survivors. Self-report of emotional stress is higher, and guess what? Emotional distress is associated with some uh, not so good lifestyle um, habits, smoking, uh, drinking, etc. Uh, there's also other associations with poor psychological health. Uh, female versus male gender, lower educational uh, attainments, unmarried status, uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera. The issue here, again, is we have to understand what these risk factors are, and we have to pinpoint and identify our patients at risk sooner than later. On the flip side, once people actually get connected 
uh, to a multidisciplinary team, there are reports of psychosocial thr uh, thriving. Many patients will say that they feel more mature uh, than their age match controls because of everything they've gone through. They may have greater compassion and empathy. They may have come up with new values and priority and have identified new strengths. So the challenges that are faced uh, by our children, uh, our uh, young adults and adolescents can actually be parlayed to something positive. What about cardiac health? This is clearly something that people have their eyes on. Uh, cardiac dysfunction is a very common late effect. Uh, it's uh, re related in large part to the use of medicines called anthracyclines. These are um, doxorubicin or dornorubicin, particularly if children who, uh, have leukemia prior to transplant, cumulative dose, and the age at the start of uh, therapy are actually very uh, significant uh, impact factors uh, with respect to who's going to develop cardiac late effects. Um, about a quarter of survivors who've had radiation to the chest may have cardiac problems. And it's interesting, again, it gets back to the fact that myocytes are heart or heart cells kind of proliferate and grow until about six months of age. And then after that, we, that's basically all we have for the rest of our lives. So if they get damaged, it's hard to kind of recoup uh, those numbers. Primary mechanisms for cardiac late effects really depend on whether or not they're from chemotherapy or radiation. Could go through this a little bit with you, but the bottom line is our patients and our kids and our families are going to be at risk because they do get high doses of chemotherapy and sometimes radiation for transplant. So what do we need to do to reduce these cardiovascular risks? Well, firstly, upfront prevention. Uh, physicians are now using cardioprotectant medicinal agents to help offset the uh, de deleterious effects of these anthracyclines. We're also trying to figure out uh, better ways to deliver radiation, decreases the do uh, decreasing the dosing and actually more uh, focusing the ports of radiation. We're also looking at identifying and treating the complications sooner than later, something called afterload reduction. There are medicines that can help the heart not work so hard. We want to correct endocrine problems that may also uh, impact cardiac um, uh, output and cardiac function, and we want to identify healthy cardiovascular lifestyle. Again, knowledge is key. Uh, if, you identify, if you understand that uh, your child might be at risk, uh, the best thing to do is identify things that can be improved sooner than later. There are some um, approaches to uh, reduce the cardiovascular risk, particularly by screening. Uh, understanding, again, the age of treatment is key, whether or not you receive radiation, particularly to the chest, and whether or not you've received these medicines called anthracycline. So with this matrix, you can come up with how frequently you really need to follow echocardiograms or MUGA scans, these tests that actually test for cardiac function. If cardiac function is falling off, then you want to make sure you're doing something early uh, to remedy that situation. What about lung dysfunction? I mentioned earlier that this is an area that I'm very interested in. Uh, there is something called bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, which is a manifestation of lung graft versus host disease. So this is a late effect that can really plague patients years after a successful transplant. Uh, bronchiolitis obliterans was first described in the 80s. Uh, it does have evidence of airway uh, obstruction, so patients can kind of have this fixed asthma. They can, be, they can have wheezing, they can have uh, cough or shortness of breath. Sometimes their x-ray findings are normal, or otherwise they can have air trapping and airway thickening. So there can be problems with the lungs that can come up on x-rays. Is this a big issue? Well, you bet you. If you look at uh, overall patients, this is about 1,000 patients, and whether or not they have developed uh, this form of obstructive lung disease uh, uh, or not. So here's the patients who do not have lung problems. Here are the patients that do. This has a big impact on survival, particularly in patients who have chronic graft-versus-host disease. So another risk factor, if your son or daughter is developing this problem, chronic graft-versus-host disease, it's got to turn off some switches that say, we need to make sure we pay attention to potential side effects in the future. And what about this lung dysfunction? There was a recent publication that showed that if you follow patients carefully, you could find decreases in lung function that actually predate symptoms. Uh, and shortness of breath, once you develop shortness of breath, that became a problem. So the issue here is you can begin to have some drop-offs in pulmonary function before you actually have cough or wheezing. So this is really a window of opportunity that I recently uh, wrote an editorial on to say, let's not wait till our patients get sick. 
let's follow them carefully post-transplant, and if we find decreases in lung function, let's do something about it. So in this con... Go ahead. Would they be diagnosed without x-rays? Absolutely. Many times the, the x-rays are normal early on. So the critical thing in our children who are over maybe age six or seven who can do these pulmonary function tests is to actually do those with some frequency to see if you can identify changes in lung function before our patients even know it. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. But uh, so I'm a big proponent of these. They're non-invasive. Kids don't generally like them. They have to sit in this tube. But depending upon the type of transplant, I'm a big advocate for at least three to four times uh, a year after an allogeneic transplant for the first two years. Then depending upon their results they can be uh, spread out to maybe twice or once a year. But you want to find those changes in pulmonary function tests be before they come so up the uh, a problem. So the transplant, you don't find it, the incidence going up? Absolutely. The incidence continues to go down. Yeah. So if, if, if pulmonary function tests look great through the first two or three years and kids are healthy, the likelihood that you're going to find something that late is, is going to be not impossible, right. but lower. Thank you. You're very welcome. So there's a bunch of things. These are not new to you guys. Good history and physical exam, assessment of oxygen levels, doing these pulmonary function tests, if need be, doing specific radiographic tests, x-rays, CAT scans, etc. There are many uh, subspecialists that we have available to us at big transplant programs, and if we need to reach out to our lung specialist to do additional tests, we do just that. How about endocrine effects? Again, big problem. 20 to 50 percent of survivors will have endocrine disturbances. Guess what the big contributing agents are? Radiation, high doses of chemotherapy, also treatment with hematopoietic stem cell transplant or BMT. Hard to see this. It should be <coughs> in your handouts. But basically, just about every uh, endocrine gland can be affected. And it can have different impacts on linear growth, the development of puberty, uh, reproductive health and function uh, can affect the adrenal glands, the thyroid glands, can affect bone health. The endocrine system is really an important system to keep our eye on. Thyroid dysfunction, a big risk. Uh, generally speaking, at least in transplant uh, survivors, a bigger problem in males and females. Here's your total body radiation uh, coming into play here. Is there growth impairment? If yes, then thyroid function is actually apparent in about a quarter of cases. So this is a simple blood test. It's a simple blood screen. It's called a TSH. You look at your thyroid stimulating hormone. If that starts going up, your body is working too hard to keep your thyroid system in balance. What about gonadal function? This is a huge issue. If, someone, if our patients have leukemia, we're looking for happily ever after. But make no mistake, if your son or daughter is now in their 20s or 30s, suddenly they might want to have children. So this is very important. I always say, if you come back to me and say, I'm unhappy, Dr. Cook, that Susie is now 25 and she cannot have children at some level, that's a victory, right? Because you've gotten Susie through that. I just got the chills. You got Susie through that early acute leukemia, and she is now a long-term survivor. So this is a big issue. We're trying to reduce the intensity of some of that chemotherapy that is delivered to kind of reduce the long-term gonadal effects. Uh, uh, bigger time on females than on males, but now with advances in reproductive endocrinology, we're thinking about ways to actually save and freeze even uh, t uh, ovarian tissue in, in toddlers. We are trying to figure out ways in older uh, young women to actually collect eggs that can be frozen. Of course, the best and the uh, long-standing um, successes with frozen embryos that has a lot of uh, that has a lot more psychosocial issues associated with it, but that is certainly, if you happen to have your soulmate and you're old enough to actually uh, collect eggs and actually have them fertilized, that is for sure uh, the best way to make sure that you can uh, improve uh, reproductive health later. Suffice to say, there are many advances in the field that I think are going to help us overcome gonadal dysfunction. But not just for reproductive health, it's also important as 
uh, young women develop, that they have the right hormonal balance for breast development to go through uh, their normal menarche. So it's important, again, to follow our patients carefully. A lot of this starts with blood tests and a good history and physical, and then uh, referrals to endocrine specialists or gynecologic specialists that can help us. And this is just an example, again, uh, looking at age of last uh, menstrual period. So gonadal dysfunction can really fall off pretty precipitously in BMT survivors compared uh, to healthy uh, patients, healthy young women. Uh, but it's just important uh, that we identify this and try to address it as soon as possible. The hypothalamus and the pituitary are the real master glands. They control the release of growth hormone. Uh, they also control the release of this thyroid stimulating hormone. So we have to pay attention again that these side effects can occur and we want to follow patients to make sure their linear growth and the reproductive uh, health uh, is intact. What about bone health? This is something that we really t uh, many times kind of um, uh, look right by, unfortunately. There are big risks, chemotherapy and steroids being the biggest. Uh, there are some host factors, uh, including uh, age, race, and weight, other underlying medical conditions. But this is very important. If our patients are on steroids in particular, uh, they can have big issues with bone thinning uh, and issues with bone density. That can lead to bone fractures, et cetera. So there are some uh, recommendations, screening something called DEXA scans. This can actually monitor bone density over time. There are supplements, things as simple as calcium and vitamin D that can help overcome uh, uh, some of these challenges and maintain good bone health. What about dental health? This is a little bit of a creepy uh, picture, but someone said, the dentist said, well, how old is his skull? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I looked and said, well, geez, they're missing the two bottom teeth. This is like a five-year-old. This is a skull from a five-year-old, unfortunately. But it is interesting. You can learn a lot about a patient by their dental health. I'll go through a couple of quick slides. But this is really dental complications are very common but often overlooked. And I think in big part because dental insurance is terrible in this country. So, but we have to pay attention to this because this has a huge impact on quality of life. And now we are developing guidelines, and uh, they are present in the Children's Oncology Group long-term follow-up guidelines to pay attention to oral and dental health. Here's an example of that, a couple of review articles that have come out. Again, giving you guys some hope that people are paying attention to this, and we are trying to identify ways to improve oral and dental health. But impaired dental health affects cosmetics, functioning and quality of life, not only of children, but certainly of adolescents and young adults and later. I mean, if a child has gone through cancer therapy and they have their teeth, they've lost their teeth, I mean, that is, has a huge impact on them. Many possible late effects, this should be in your handout, uh, but it will include altered tooth development, accelerated decay, root thinning, uh, cranial facial abnormalities, on and on. So we have to pay attention to these things. The big contributors to development of problems are patient age, the agent and dose of chemotherapy, radiation including source, dose, volume, whether it was fractionated, you know, one big, uh, one big chunk or smaller chunks, and chronic graft versus host disease after transplant all have big impacts on oral and dental health. Absolutely. So with the radiation, is it more prevalent when you have cranial radiation versus a specific other area with regards to oral? Absolutely. It's, you think more about it's the, if it's cranial radiation that has involved the jaw. Uh, so sometimes you'll actually talk about ports. There's ways to actually deliver radiation to kind of uh, spare some of the other areas. But anytime you're going to involve the jaw uh, or the um, uh, kind of unexpressed teeth, with radiation, that's going to have the biggest impact. And, you know, we won't need to go through all of these things. It should be in your handouts as well. But again, potential late effects, predisposing therapy. But more importantly, what are factors that we can modify? What are the recommended screening and consideration? Again, in, in, important to know that despite the increased risk for dental complications, we know that there are suboptimal rates of regular dental care among childhood cancer survivors is prevalent. This is very concerning because you can optimize this by identifying the problems, 
early in life. This is going to be a team approach. You're going to hear me say this over and over again. It involves dentistry, the pediatrician, and the pediatric oncologist or transplant doctor. As we finish up, we're going to talk a little bit about secondary malignancies. Oh my God, if my son or daughter had leukemia, are you telling me that they can have another cancer later? Well, unfortunately, yes. We do have to pay attention to this. The delivery of radiation uh, can contribute to the development of solid tumors with a long latency period of up to 10 years, whereas the delivery of certain chemotherapies can actually lead to uh, chemotherapy-induced leukemias. That usually occurs a little sooner. There are some underlying uh, genetic predispositions that run through families that can increase the risk of this. Uh, breast cancer is also something that we have to screen for in patients who have had Hodgkin's disease, and sometimes those patients will go on to have transplant. Skin cancers are more prevalent, have to be very careful with sun exposure. We talked about risk to thyroid function, and thyroid cancer can be a problem, particularly if you're getting radiation to this area. Same with sarcomas of bone and secondary uh, brain tumors. Risk of infection is very, very important. This is multifactorial, uh, but radiation chemotherapy, and other uh, immune suppressive agents, pre and after transplant can increase your risk of, uh, of infection. Also the type of graft. Did we take out these T cells that are important to graft versus host disease, but these T cells also help reconstitute the immune system. The further you're out from transplant, the better you are, but you always have to be careful. Age at transplant and thymic function. The thymus is the school where many of your blood cells are, are basically educated to be better defenders of, uh, of the body from infection. Chronic graft versus host disease has a huge impact on infection risk. And prevention is important. Monitor immune function. Re-immunize your children and make sure you're taking antimicrobial prophylaxis medicines like Bactrim, acyclovir, et cetera, that will help protect your children from infection. What if you did T-cell depletion four years post-transplant? T-cell depletion four years post-transplant. So there were medications that were delivered to take the T-cells out later? We did the ECP therapy for T-cell depletion. Um, for skin graft versus, graft versus host, host disease. disease. So it's very interesting. ECP is a, uh, is a wonderful form of therapy for graft versus host disease. It does take the blood cells out, treats them with a certain medicinal agent, and then gives them UV light, and then puts those T cells back in. Interestingly enough, that form of therapy tends to be less immune suppressive than your steroids, tacrolimus, cyclosporins. So I think... Um, Hopefully, the chronic graft versus host disease was treated well. I think that may have an impact on immune reconstitution, but it's believed to be less so than some of those other medicinal agents that we use. What about low-dose IL-2 therapy? We've been doing that for a year, shots daily for a year for that. So low-dose IL-2 actually does stimulate the immune system, and when it was first uh, released in the New England Journal, people said, oh, my goodness, how could you give IL-2 to a patient whose immune system is, is too aggressive because people thought that that would actually stimulate the T cells. Well, it actually stimulates a certain population of T cells more so, and they're called regulatory cells. So those cells, you want to increase those cells to get them more in balance, I think time will tell to see what impact uh, that particular approach has on infection, but the feeling is you're just restoring some of the normal balance in the body, so hopefully the impact on increased infection risk will be low. Okay. Thank but you. I don't know that for certain. So we're going to finish up here um, a little over, but uh, hopefully this, you'll still find this to be helpful. You know, I've said this once, I'll say it again, multidisciplinary team approach. You've got to stay connected with your bone marrow transplant team, whether it's pediatric or internal medicine as, uh, as your kids and family members get older. But there's still going to be a connection with your primary care physician. Nursing and advanced practitioners play a huge role in continuity of care over the course of time. You're going to have to be connected with coordinators and social workers, dentists, fertility experts, but your bone marrow transplant team and the coordination of the team, and, 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 and you can tell me later, this is a big, this is a big uh, uh, approach to the delivery of care uh, post-transplant, and many times we will identify uh, late effects specialists to help us with this. Our goal is to create this seamless continuum of care. Pediatric oncologists, transplanters, primary care providers, and subspecialists following transplant. We want to build awareness with primary care physicians and our families and make sure they know that it's very important that there is a need for long-term follow-up. You can't just put this in your rearview mirror and move forward. Uh, stay connected. 
uh, with your practitioners and, and BMT, stay knowledgeable, and make sure that we pay attention to identifying these problems early. Many unique challenges must be considered. I think it's very important out front, your choice of oncology specialists and center. Uh, do they have a very robust bone marrow transplant program? You want to think about the therapeutic regimen. Are you getting, is your child going to get a full intensity or a reduced intensity regimen? Can we move more to reduced intensity regimens in pediatrics? That's something we've done in adults. So now we can transplant patients who are 50, 60, and 70 years old whereas before we couldn't. But there's a big push now to start thinking about can we reduce the intensity of conditioning? Are you in a clinical trial that may ask and answer a question that impacts late effects? Again, we, we speak about this multidisciplinary approach, the integration of psychosocial care, heightened awareness, which I hope today uh, helped uh, provide for you, and then to identify and address those uh, unique issues related to survivorship. So how can, I, uh, how can I really end with a couple of, of very positive uh, points? Stay connected with your primary BMT team. Let me tell you something. We love you guys. Uh, now with, uh, with social media, internet, I get emails. I just got the goose pimples again. From people I took care of 20 years ago. Dr. Cook, do you remember us? I remember you. What, are you kidding me? Of course I remember you. My wife remembers you. And here's the pictures I took of your child who's now graduated college when she was five and I took care of her when she had leukemia. Stay connected. Make no mistake. We want to stay connected with you. Be staunch advocates of your kids, even after they turn 18. Every time, well, you know, Joey's 18 now. Joey's 18 now. I live in New Jersey. My mother lives in New Jersey. When I got in last night, she wanted me to call her and make sure I got here safe. She's 85. I'm going to be 50. This thing about after 18, they're on their own, that's baloney. <laughs> I mean, they need to make their decisions, but be a staunch advocate for them. Remind them they are on the planet for a reason. They're survivors, so make sure they do everything they can to continue to optimize their care. And then do everything you can to put them in the best position for happily ever after. And I have no doubt that together we can and will continue to make a difference. So uh, there are a lot of people who are out there fighting for your children, not only at the time of leukemia or their underlying disorder, but as they grow up and continue to be long-term survivors. So this, I love this line, children are 30% of our population, but 100% of our future. This was a dear patient of mine when I was recently in Cleveland. So he would say, you know, he was 22 or 23. He was uh, an undergraduate at Case Western. He would say, you know, at the ripe old age of 23, I'm already a two-time cancer survivor. He had a bone cancer. He then developed leukemia. He went on to get an unrelated donor transplant, and now he's in his late 20s. He does face some challenges, but he is a survivor, and we are doing everything we can there to make sure that his long-term uh, uh, issues are being addressed regularly, but what a, what a terrific uh, patient and what a terrific family. There are many resources that are available to you guys. Uh, this is the uh, long-term follow-up guidelines that have been put up by CureSearch and the Children's Oncology Group. Uh, many centers, I'm sure Columbia does as well, uh, many big centers will have survivor programs. The, the one at Hopkins is really terrific. Survivors from any program are eligible. There's no age limitations. It's really an opportunity to transcend age and basically uh, educate our patients and families about the long-term side effects. So here's our post-discussion uh, questions, right? So because pediatric beige regimens are kinder and gentler, they've been associated with inferior outcomes. Absolutely not. In fact, the whole adolescent, young adult dilemma, if you take those patients and you treat them more aggressively with pediatric uh, transplant regimens in a pediatric center, the outcomes are better. Now, I have a big, strong adult transplant presence at Hopkins. They don't like when I say that, but that's what the data shows over and over again. Once your, uh, pay, your child is two years out from transplant, all of those medical problems are in the re rearview mirror. Well, that's absolutely false. We have to make sure that we're identifying problems through two, five, and ten years out. And uh, not to repeat this all again, but we do know that long-term side effects are really a consequence of pre-transplant, peri-transplant uh, treatments, and transplant-related complications. So this was absolutely true. Uh, as I finish, I, I want to send out many acknowledgments. I just moved to Hopkins about a year ago, loved being back on the East Coast. I was out in the Midwest for a while, uh, which was nice, but can't take, the, uh, can't take the city out of the kid, I guess is what they say. So great program there. I have a great laboratory. I've been blessed to have a translational research program over the last 15 
uh, to 18 years. Kathy Rubel is our long-term survivor specialist. She uh, was very uh, helpful in providing some slides. Natalia Chalmers is actually a dentist and a PhD who works down at the NIH, uh, who also uh, provided some slides and some uh, input. Uh, we've really had some nice funding uh, support from the work that we've done, but my heart always, uh, and thanks, always goes out to our patients and their families. And I always end with uh, my secrets to success. It always reminds me why I keep coming to work every day. Number one, remain passionate and committed. Two, embrace teamwork and camaraderie. Three, find a good mentor and then be one. This is my favorite, be too good to be ignored. Certainly back on the East Coast, this is generally the approach that we take. Find your happy place and raise the standard. And there's no question that we're all interested in really making outstanding clinical research synonymous with, with best clinical care. So that's why you should really seek out the, the really fantastic uh, programs in the area uh, if your kids need a transplant. And here's one of my happy places. You might see this is Cape May, New Jersey. I grew up not more than 15 minutes from here, but it's really great to be back on the East Coast, and I always enjoy being back in northern New Jersey in this uh, uh, New York, New Jersey area. So with that, I will say thank you. I know I went a little longer, but I'm glad we had an opportunity to uh, answer some questions during uh, the presentation, and I'm happy to answer more at this point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ken. Well, it's very enlightening um, and inspirational talk. Um, do people have some other questions that they'd like to ask? Um, when you were talking about um, radiation, do you have any differences or um, different outcomes of standard radiation versus proton in the that, chest field? That's a great, great question. The answer that I personally do not. Proton therapy is now something that is being delivered at a handful of institutions. Mm -hmm. It gets back to modifications of kind of port and intensity of radiation. So for those of you that are not familiar with photons, the goal is to actually be able to deliver radiation. If you, if you were radiating something in the middle of the body, standard radiation, you're, you, you're going to target that area, but then you're going to hit your chest wall, your skin, your subcutaneous tissue, the breast, the heart, everything until you actually get to that tumor that you really want to knock off. And the delivery of proton therapy is supposed to get around that by being, you, you basically can give a pulse that will not cause any damage to the outer parts of the body until the photons get to the tumor and then they can be energized. So you really kind of target, it's almost like Star Trek technology, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be able to target a very specific area in the body. This takes meticulous planning because you can imagine if you're going to just unleash these photons and you're a little off from your target, that can cause bigger problems. So great question. The goal is, again, to limit the scope and scatter of uh, the intensity of scatter irradiation, so to limit some of those side effects that I think will play a big role in reducing cardiovascular effects, reducing the uh, likelihood of secondary tumors. Thank you. Are there more questions? We do have a little more time. Yeah, absolutely. Go. Sure. In the AYA population, what is your thought process on antidepressants as that particular age group goes through um, a transplant? Another great question. I really believe that uh, you know most of the struggles that our patients are going to go through are not those that you can say, Johnny, just suck it up. This, there's so much that is going on, particularly in that age group. They're, they're trying to break away from their parents. They're being pulled back down. They want to be independent, and they are now wickedly, uh, they're trying to be independent. They're now wickedly dependent. It can have impact on their, uh, their body habitus, their appearance. Uh, you can go on and on and on. Missing school. Friends will get it in the beginning, but it's really saddening for me over the course of time. Friends, best friends will step up at the time of the original diagnosis, but as patients continue to go on in therapy, they need to go on to transplant, those, that friend base really kind of dissolves. And it's not because people are not good people or good friends, but they just don't, they don't understand. They may be frightened themselves. So many times patients will be left kind of more on their own, and that can really be devastating. So to answer your question, I'm a big advocate for that. I think whatever 
uh, we need to do to help uh, maintain chemical balance. It's not something that I would prescribe personally. There are some transplant physicians that will, well, let's give Zoloft, let's give Prozac. I really refer that to our psychiatrist to make a diagnosis, and then I want to make sure that it's not just giving a medicine. Let's make sure there is ongoing uh, psychotherapy that's going to help that individual through some of those problems, address what the challenges are, and then try to make inroads into helping that person get over those barriers. So it's combination. I am a big proponent of that, but I would generally make sure in a multidisciplinary approach that I have reached out to my colleagues in social work or psychology, that I've reached out to my colleagues in psychiatry so that we can not only dose appropriately, but dose modify as needed. But in an AYA population, I have an 18-year-old who declined after he was too far into the process. So therefore, they were talking about making it sort of a standard protocol, even though there was um, psychiatric, you know, meetings all the way along from the isolation piece of it, from being an 18-year-old, then therefore the parent cannot overrule an 18-year-old who has every legal right to say no. Sure. Well, so the standard course of how do we incorporate it to make sure that we're not, we don't, we're not behind the eight ball on that piece of it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't know that it would be something that we could add in like a prophylactic antibiotic like, you know, like fluconazole, but... I'm a big believer that the time to introduce a social worker or psychologist is not, you know, after transplant when someone has graft versus host disease. Those resources, and this is always a sore spot, you have to have money, institutions and programs have to have money to be able to pay for psychologists and social workers. Those relationships have to be developed at the get-go. As far as I'm concerned, anyone who comes to see me has a crisis, right, because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blood stem cell doctor, right? Anyone who comes, walks into my office, I don't care how happy they are, how intact the family is, this is a wicked crisis that transcends any normal adolescent uh, challenge. So that's when I think the, the way to get to that, it's not perfect, but if you develop those relationships early, then perhaps you, you'll have a better uh, opportunity to connect with people and get them to under, understand the importance of these uh, medicinal agents and psychotherapy uh, when they're going through a tough time. If you try to introduce that afterward, you're going to get talked to the hand uh, many times, particularly from adolescents. I'm a social worker in a transplant in a pediatric transplant center, and beha on behalf of all social workers everywhere, I thank you for that last comment because um, it's uh, it's so important to be an integral part of the team. Um, I think regarding your question about um, medications, I think we really have to. There's such a stigma attached to uh, psychotropic medications, and I think if we normalize it as part of the transplant, uh, that changes in uh, behavior or um, psychological functioning can change as part of the transplant, um, I think that that's very important. So, But even if the teams are brought in at the beginning, you, you can, with, with somebody who turns, who's 18, it's, it's really the age thing. You know. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a challenge. So it's a challenge. That's a different challenge altogether. They, everybody was brought in at the beginning through the whole process, but when we got to a certain point, when I would have said yes, he said no. Yes. So. And many times with, with uh, continued encouragement and continued reinforcement, I've seen, I've seen that change. I've seen uh, young adults uh, ultimately kind of give in, if you will, and say, okay, but uh, it, it's, it's hard. And, and you, have to, um, you have to be very mindful of, of the fact that they do have control there. You have to be, try to be supportive and continue to remind folks, kids, young adults, why we think this is necessary. I also I think it's very important to say up front, we say all the time, your blood counts are going to go down. Your hair is going to fall out. You may not want to eat. We're going to do I say, listen, you're going, to, you're going to really struggle. You might feel sad. You might feel lonely. You might feel frightened. We have members of our team are going to address that. We also have medications that can help there. If you bring it up up front rather than saying, well, you're kind of feeling blue, and we ran this test, and we did this scan, and we, we can't find anything. So, yeah, why don't you take, why don't you take an antidepressant? I'm kind of um, exaggerating a little bit, but I think it's important to introduce those things 
earlier. When I was, I was at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, we had a great palliative care team. As soon as the patients came into our transplant unit, they met the palliative care team. People were like, whoa, what are you talking about, Doc? I thought you said we're going for cure. I said we are going for cure. Palliative care is comfort. So I want you to meet these team, these team players now so they are part of your entire course in the hospital. If something happens to Susie or Johnny and we're really worried about this isn't working, you've already established a relationship with these individuals, but we're in it to win it. But if, when your child is having difficulties either with pain or depression, you're going you're gonna to build a relationship with individuals from the get-go so that they are available to you if and when you need them. So it is about introducing uh, team players early and the concept that if this goes wrong, we may have some things that can help you, <coughs> whether it's counseling or medicinal agents. I have a quick question. How, um, when do you refer your patients back to oncology, or how long should the patients stay with the transplant team medically? We never refer them back. No. <laughs> <coughs> well, I think that depends in large part about the comfort level. So, you know, if they're internal patients, we can refer the patients back sooner than later. We certainly want to have most of the acute transplant issues kind of dealt with. I always like to say, let's deliver the package with a nice bow on it. <coughs> if they're, they're being referred from the outside, the oncologists are a little not sure, they're a little worried about uh, taking care of a post-transplant patient, then we'll hold on to them longer. I think you have to establish that comfort level up front and then decide when it's going to be best for the families and for the referring physician to be comfortable. I think regular, excuse me, transplant follow-up is important. Again, the delivery of care, it's not about the procedure, but you have to make sure that you're seeing someone who understands, oh, you, Johnny or Susie is now two years out, <coughs> breathing fine, no problems, you still need pulmonary function tests. You have to check your thyroid function. How are you growing and developing? Uh, do we have to check your, uh, your growth hormone levels? Do we have to check uh, your, your sex hormone levels, your estrogen levels, your uh, testosterone levels? So those things, I think, really continue to belong in a transplant program or in a long-term follow-up program. And it may go undiagnosed or unthought of if you're back to your general pediatrician or internist or even back with your primary oncologist. I hear this all the time with adults. I just don't think adult oncologists many times understand the late effects that can occur uh, in transplant survivors. So lifelong check-ins with... I'd never, and that's, that's the beauty of having adolescent young adult programs, of having long-term survivorship programs, because you can have someone who walks into your pediatric clinic and they're 30, right. and they're welcomed, and the nurses who've been there for 20 years, you know, gives them a big hug. That's really, I think there should be a lifelong connection. Sometimes it, it may have to go from adult to pediatric, excuse me, from pediatric to adult transplant, but just about everywhere I've been, we've been able to maintain these connections and continue to have people come back even into their 20s and 30s. If they have to be admitted to the hospital, right. that can be a little bit different, but... Um, but from a clinic appointment, it's usually not a problem. And even on a lifelong yearly checkup for thyroid function and for pulmonary and for your heart and for all of those things? And some of these things can be delegated back to your primary care provider, right? right. That's just why um, communication and education is not just to patients and families, but we want to provide these are the things that if you go back to Dr. Smith, and he's a pediatrician or an internist, we can have Dr. Smith do some of those things as well. I have a but hard it, time finding a pediatric doctor in Seattle who is comfortable taking my transplant child. I've gone through several pediatricians because they just don't know how to care. And so my transplant doctor is almost like his primary care doctor. I get a cold or he gets a cold, we call them yeah. and figure out what the next step is. And so... It's one of the things I actually, I must admit, I love about this job because you, you, you are involved with the patients at their most vulnerable time. Right. I, I, I say our families come to us with the trust of a child. I mean, your child has leukemia, so we have that intense opportunity. But then you can be, still become a pediatrician. You can watch kids grow up, go to their first baseball game, graduate college, have a child. I mean, I get pictures of, 
my ex patients who you know here's my son and you're like wow you had pretty high chemotherapy but we paid attention maybe we did uh, sperm collection before transplant because we were thinking about the long-term side effects maybe we cryopreserved eggs now in a, in a young woman so these are things that I really enjoy about the job it, it, sometimes it's a little harder because you might have to travel further to get back to Seattle to right. get back to Hopkins uh, but I think you would always find that you're very welcomed when you come back mm -hmm. uh, and our job is to try to make it so you don't always have to make that trip you know back to the mothership gotcha thank you again thank you very much dr cook this is a wonderful session i'm glad you enjoyed it yeah my pleasure if you see me around grab a hold of me or track me down if uh, uh you should have my contact information uh talk to susan in the group uh, i'd love to talk to you more i hope you're all in terrific hands and uh thank you for coming out today thank you, thank you.